Hey, podcast listeners. I'm Barbara Morgan, and you're listening to Austin Film Festival's On Story podcast. This week on On Story, we're joined by Shang Chi and Wonder Woman 1984 writer Dave Callahan for a conversation on writing blockbusters intertwined with personal experiences. Dave Callahan is a screenwriter and producer. He co-wrote the screenplay for the highly praised Shang-Chi, a superhero film adapted from the Marvel comic series, as well as Wonder Woman 1984, based on the DC Comics character. Shang-Chi tells the story of a martial arts master who is forced to revisit his past when he is confronted by members of a secret organization called the Ten Rings. A mix of action, adventure, and fantasy, Shang-Chi was not only an outstanding commercial success, but also a huge breakthrough in cinema, as it marked Marvel's first film with an Asian director, lead, and predominantly Asian cast. Moderator Casey Barron spoke with Callahan during a panel at the Austin Film Festival. Clips of Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings, courtesy of Marvel Film Studios. Clips of Doom, courtesy of Universal Pictures Home Entertainment. Clips of Jean-Claude Van Johnson, courtesy of Amazon Studios. Obviously, you've worked on a lot of blockbusters. Were blockbuster films something that was um, a family sort of event for you or something that was just extremely meaningful in your life that propelled you to this spot? I wasn't that into film when I was young. I was raised in a household where we didn't have cable TV. We, my, my parents didn't have much of an interest in movies or Western culture. So my storytelling background probably stems from reading, from writing. Because of the way I was raised, the way that I got into movies was I would go to my friends' houses and they were into movies. And I was raised in the 80s, so the movies they were into were Arnold Schwarzenegger movies. So all the first I saw was 80s action movies, which is, you know, really the advent of the modern blockbuster in a lot of ways. And so I grew up on that stuff. I loved it. Schwarzenegger, Van Damme, who I later got to work with, which was awesome. So that, that type of large-scale filmmaking has always been the most interesting type of movie for me to go see as a viewer. I have very populist sensibilities. Do you have a favorite 80s action film? Bloodsport is probably my favorite. <laughs> I think Predator might actually be the best of them. I love Bloodsport. It's ridiculous in a lot of spots. It, it holds up pretty well. When I look at Predator, I think of like the storytelling and the structure of that movie. The acting all works for what they're being asked to do. And the Predator looks really, really good still. Were there any particular heroes in your life, either real or fictional, that you were also trying to create stories for at some point or another? So when I was growing up not watching movies, what I was watching was professional wrestling. This remains the case now because it's the core of what large-scale professional wrestling is supposed to be built around, these giant superhero characters. But in the 80s especially, the first time I saw The Ultimate Warrior, and I was a very undersized Chinese kid with a bowl cut, I was like, what the f*** is that? That is the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. I will say that that was sort of my first introduction to like a superhero figure, a, a giant heroic figure. Hey, I mean, pro wrestling has made a lot of fantastic actors and filmmakers too. Dave Bautista, obviously, part of the MCU. Yeah, what's that one guy's name? <laughs> the big guy, The Rock. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a perfect segue in some ways. Doom, let's talk about it for a second. As part of your bio, I find it so funny you mentioned potentially derailing his career at the start. Personally, one of my uh, favorite movies, actually. What was it like to be a part of that project and at the time adapt a video game that for a lot of people, the medium of video games was not necessarily looked at as a narrative of, or storytelling? Doom was the first studio project I got hired to write. I got hired to write that a couple of weeks after I sold my first script. I sold a spec. That piece of material was very dark. The first meeting I ever took in Hollywood was with Lorenzo de Bonaventura, who several weeks prior had been the worldwide president of production at Warner Brothers and had just recently transitioned into producing. He was asked which titles he wanted to bring with him. Doom was one of them. He took me out to dinner. I was sweating and I, I was stuttering a lot. I was so nervous. He's a very like prolific figure. And he said, would you be interested in Doom? And I said, yes, absolutely. I'm familiar with the game. And he said, great. 
I'm going to give you a date and a time and you're going to come to Warner's and you're going to pitch your take. And I had no idea what any of that meant. I was like, okay, what does that mean? And he said, just show up and tell us what you think the movie could be. So I showed up with no sense of what a pitch was, no sense of what a meeting was, essentially. I mean, it sounds ridiculous now. I had my notes written on a napkin because I was unprofessional. And I pitched a room that had 20 people in it and that I later found out included basically everybody at Warner Brothers. I look back at it now and I think that what happened there was because I didn't have any sense of what I was doing or who the people involved were, which again is on me, I should have. I had very little fear. I just walked in and was like, here you go. And I got hired in the room, which is also the only time that's ever happened to me in my life. And I think it's just a, a continuing factor of just being so green and so, so full of energy and so, so excited to do it. And so I got the job. Come here. Come here. This is what? Oh, God. Have you found anything like this on your archaeological digs? No. Is there any way this thing came from the outside, from the surface? The planet is completely dead. It came from somewhere, lady. Portman, shut up. The atmosphere on the surface can't support life. Maybe it doesn't need air. It could have come from another planet or something. What, like an alien? Look at that thing! And then I wrote Doom. <laughs> and then I, then the rosy stuff stopped because I learned that you were going to work really hard and you're going to do billions of rewrites. And I got fired and rehired and fired and rehired. And I was involved in a lot of different parts of the movie, but not as many of them as I thought I would be initially. I got to experience like all the ups and downs of a large-scale studio screenwriting, um, which was great. And then the movie didn't perform in the way that we all hoped it would. And... Uh, Luckily, I survived that, and so did Dwayne. Being of Chinese-American descent, what did that experience and that heritage allow you to bring to the forefront of your storytelling uh, when you started in the industry, but also trying to figure out how to make your path? I mean, I'll just be blunt about it. There has not been a particularly wonderful representation of Asians on screen in, in most Western media. So I've been writing professionally for 19 years. I'd say the first 17, my entire job was just to pretend I wasn't an Asian guy. I would get hired and immediately my job became, okay, how do I put myself in the shoes of a beautiful white man named Chris? I watch enough movies that I am very adept at fantasizing about being a hero and about what it must be like to have doors open for you and to have just the the privilege of being that type of personality on screen. But I don't have any sort of life experience like that whatsoever. And because I wasn't seeing it on screen as a kid, I couldn't even fathom what an Asian guy would look like as a hero. And then Shang-Chi comes along and, you know, it's, it was a very emotional process for me. It was so hectic and frantic in terms of storytelling that I wasn't that plugged in in that moment into the cultural elements other than pitching what I wanted to see. And then when I sat down to write the movie, like one week in, I just had a total freak out. I, I had a real emotional moment where, because the stuff I was writing um, the first week was all of the stuff in San Francisco where you're seeing Sean at the time and Katie. If uh, Sean is, turns out to be Shang-Chi if you haven't seen the movie. Um, and that is an experience I've lived. I grew up in the Bay Area. I, as you can see, I think, a Chinese-American. And um, I just sort of sat back and I, I got very emotional. I was like, this is the first time in 19 years anyone's ever asked me to tell any version of my story. Not my story, but just even to put a Chinese face on screen. And I'm also fascinated by the sort of mythology of, uh, or specifically Chinese mythology, pardon me, and what from that space you were able to bring into Shang-Chi outside of what was already imbued within the pre-existing comics and IP. Yeah, the pre-existing comics were not real helpful. Um, any, If anyone out here is not familiar with them, and I don't know why you would be. They, Shang-Chi was created in the late 70s to capitalize on essentially the Bruce Lee boom. Um, it was created by, Shang-Chi was created by two white men who I don't believe had any sort of malicious intent or stereotypes that they were intending to put out. It was just the late 70s. And so in the first 
run of publication, Shang-Chi is uh, the son of Fu Manchu, uh, the literal character Fu Manchu who, that Marvel had borrowed, um, who looked exactly like you all think he looked and behaved like you think he behaved and t talked like you think he talked. And that was bad. Um, but Shang-Chi himself wasn't much better. I grew up loving mythology. I think for some reason, it's a thing that a lot of kids really gravitate towards. I think it's just such classic storytelling art. Now, I was into Greek mythology because it was, I think, usually the most accessible mythology when you're in school. You get that Dolores book of Greek mythology, and it's got the cool pictures, and you know, I got into that. When I was in college, I got into Norse mythology. Um, I don't have a lot of background in Chinese mythology or Eastern mythology. I dove into it when I got hired. I, I knew some stuff. Um, I'm very interested in mystical creatures, though. Uh, cryptids, but also, you know, well, unicorns, all, all of the stuff. And so some of the some of the stuff you might see in the third act of Shang-Chi was stuff that I had pretty deep knowledge of. But the storytelling principles of Shang-Chi are all really just based off of identifying identifying things that the entire Asian diaspora might recognize as somewhat close to home and then just working out of that. Gotcha. Um, <laughs> mythical creatures. Do you have a particular set of mythical creatures that are like, those are my dudes? <laughs> or I'm curious. In the third act, they drive into a, a mystical Chinese village and there's all sorts of rad <laughs> wandering around and there's these weird horses that are sort of scaly and sort of they're known his, as the Chinese unicorn. Japan has their own version. I'm just drawn to that stuff because it feels so big and because it answers questions that we all have. All this existential stuff that most of humankind at some point in their lives wonders. Most of these myths come from a place of trying to explain those things and trying to put context into our world, but in a way that is really romantic to think about. I've found that the escapism of being able to write these big movies where you're just talking about magic and about really crazy big ideas, I find that to be a lot more soothing personally. But yeah, I mean, obviously Wonder Woman is not a mythology that I built, but you're talking about a very deep mythology there. When I was working on Godzilla, I, I, I mean, Godzilla has an incredible mythology. I don't think people tend to think of Godzilla as a mythology, I think, especially because the movies over time have had such disparate, you know, sort of eras. But, you know, there, there's so much stuff behind Godzilla, behind all the kaiju. Mythology is exciting to me. I love the romantic notion that there is more to the world that we can't see. And then if you just walked around the right corner at the right time, you'd see something weird. That's awesome. Wow. Moving forward a little bit. Jean-Claude Van Johnson. I historically only write movies, which I don't know why that is. Um, probably just a, I, I became comfortable with that storytelling technique. Writing TV is a very different game. I got a call from my, I had a, an agent at UTA because I don't write TV. Basically, they had assigned a guy whose job was to call me once a year and be like, do you want to do TV? And I'd go, no. And he'd hang up. <laughs> and he called me. And he said, I know this is a pass, but Ridley Scott's company wants to make a TV show with Jean-Claude Van Damme. The, the way it was pitched to me was basically like 24 starring Jean-Claude Van Damme. Just totally serious, just essentially a TV extension of the kind of stuff he was doing for the last 15 years anyway, sort of the VOD kind of very cool, very Jean-Claude action stuff. But it didn't sound like it was going to stretch his talents very far and... To be honest, I'm a huge Jean-Claude Van Damme fan, and I didn't think I would watch that. And so they asked me what I would do instead. I was like, I would, I would write a comedy for him. I would try to get as weird as I can and introduce people to all this interesting other stuff I think he's capable of. If, if you ever saw that movie, JCVD, we, you know, we, we borrowed quite a bit from that because there you're seeing him operate at a completely different level. How do you find yourself... Um not just depicting those scenes, but thinking about those scenes as you developed your narrative and script? I mean, action's really tricky. The, the real truth is, the key to action sequences is you just have to, the one thing you have to have is you have to go in knowing what the emotional journey of the action scene is. 
You know, so in Shang-Chi, for example, that bus sequence that people seem to really like, which I, I like too, it's really cool action. But what's important about that scene is it is Shang-Chi being unmasked. Now, he's not wearing a mask literally, but he's been hiding behind this fake identity and code switching into an American lifestyle. And he is threatened in a way that he cannot tolerate. And the proverbial mask comes off and he becomes Shang-Chi in that moment. And he fights, and that's very cool, but it's not just a fight where you're watching a fight. You're watching Aquafina's character, Katie, realize in real time that this person who is my best friend who I thought I knew, I don't know at all. And that's what the story of that fight sequence is. Sean, hey, you need to tell me what the hell's going on. What are you doing? Where are you going? Macau. Macau? Those guys are going after my sister next. I have to get to her first. You have a sister? Look, I know this is confusing. I'll explain it when I get back, I promise. No, no. Hey, tell no, me. dude. This is I've been by your side for half your life. I get there are things you never wanted to talk about, and I never wanted to push. But a guy with a freaking machete for an arm just chopped our bus in half, Sean. Who the hell are you? Every fight sequence has to be built around some sort of personal journey, um, even if it's just as simple as I found out I could do more than I thought I could. So that's always first. You're always trying to figure out what is happening for the characters. What are the beats inside of this where they doubt themselves, they pick themselves back up, they learn something. Then you build around that. I want to jump back into Shang-Chi in a second, talk about Wonder Woman a, a little bit more. What was that creative process between you and Patty, and I'm sure Gal? Wonder Woman was never mine and it never will be mine and none of these things are mine but it was never my story to tell i was just helping patty out shang chi it's not mine but i do feel a sense of ownership's not the right word but i'm very connected to that movie because of what it is and what it represents for me and what it represents for my family members and what it represents for the culture and so when black widow was released on day and date in theaters and on disney plus i got really nervous and we had already shifted release dates a number of times. Truth is, you know, the, the original Wonder Woman I was not involved in, but I had a relationship with Patty. Um, I had written a smaller movie that she was attached to direct. We had a great relationship working on it. And then she got offered Wonder Woman and she bounced, which was the correct move, it turned out, for her. And then, you know, years went by and we all did our stuff. And then, as I like to tell it, she like it's like a golden private jet pulled up outside of my house one day. And pa my old friend Patty opened the door and was like, okay, Dave, I'm back. Come with me. That's what, that was what it was like. She just invited me along. And she said, we already know what the story is. I know what I want to do. I just need help writing it. And I trust you. And I like you. Will you do it? <laughs> I was like, yeah, that sounds awesome. Patty knew that she wanted to make a movie that was much more colorful and vibrant than the first movie. I think she's very proud of the first movie, but you know, World War I is not the most fun time in human history. So she wanted to do something a little poppier. She wanted to make a movie that she described to me as being more in line with um, the first Superman movie that, that Richard Donner made, just something more fun. I said, whatever you want, <laughs> you know? And so, you know, I was coming at a, at a bit of a deficit because both Patty and Jeff had worked on the first movie. So I had to watch the first movie and, you know, understand the character as best I could. And then we all just wrote it together. It was really simple and fun and like no ego, really collaborative. It was great. It was wonderful. Specifically for that character, Diana goes on such an interesting sort of arc where this lost love returns back to her life and she has to set him aside to achieve a greater goal of greater purpose. Was that part of Patty's sort of idea from the very beginning? I thought it was a really beautiful story. You know, for me personally, I just find characters like Wonder Woman really tragic. Any any story about somebody who has to outlive everyone that they love, I, it just like, it gets to me. And I always looked at the movie through that lens and thinking about what it would mean to her to get Steve back after all of that loss and then have to let him go again. Ugh. I mean, it still f me up. Also, it's funny. 
<laughs> it's fun. I remember reading the treatment thing like, oh, this is fun because in the first movie, Diana's the fish out of water and she's, she's you know, the knife in, in man's world. And then we got to do it for Steve, which was really funny because Chris is really good at that kind of thing. Just walking around like a dummy asking, what's this? What's that? Like, I just thought that was so fun. And then you have the antagonist of the film going on this journey that's tied to a desire for more, constantly more. But at the same time, he has this young son that seemingly may be his world, and he wants to provide for him, and it's part of his motivations. But you can see the juxtaposition of what the actions to get there does to him as a person versus the actual effect at the end of the day. Was that villain always sort of comprised that way, or was that a an interesting sort of contrast to Diana's arc that evolved over time. I would say a lot of the shading of how that character came together is something we found in the writing. You know, I, one of the things that I'm very interested in in all of these superhero stories is figuring out how to make the villains almost not be villains, if I can get away with it, to make the villains so understand, like to have them coming from such a recognizable place. And all the, the, the problem is not what they believe. The, and by the way, there are great villains who believe terrible things too. In my case, though, I'm interested in villains that are doing things that have feelings that you feel. They're just willing to go to a much weirder place. And also they have access to things like magic rocks and <laughs> um, But so Max Lord, you know, he doesn't want to look like a loser to his kid. It's like such a brutal thing idea for a parent to feel like they're embarrassing their own child or not living up to what they want to be and you he's a little bit like a gambler our version of the character because it's like he tries something and it just goes it makes it worse and he's like well I'll just double down and you know and he just it gets dumber it gets worse and worse and for him and it's that's an interesting character because <laughs> the way that Pedro played him is like 50% the most off the wall bonkers Nick Cage performance possible and 50% so grounded and emotional, which I like. I, I find it to be very, you know, of the tone of the 80s superhero movies. You know, if you look forward then to Shang-Chi and Wen Wu, it's the same principle. It's a guy who just wants his wife back. That's the bad guy plot of that movie. Like, spoiler alert. He doesn't want to take over the world. He doesn't want to, you know, build a weather control device. He just wants his wife back. But because he has access to some pretty spectacular things, that's what he's going to be willing to do. And so in Shang-Chi, Wen Wu, yeah, is such a fantastic antagonist. It feels like part of the film is about grappling with this dual identity, certainly. But also in a case for uh, Shang-Chi, really just trying to find what, who am I and sort of what am I about here? Um, how did you find the balance or the difficulty of balancing that while you're putting together the script? That's a pretty constant evolution as you're writing. You know, like you have the big idea in your head that Destin and I always knew it was going to be a story about this guy who didn't want to follow in his father's footsteps. So he runs away and he starts a new life. But when you do that, it's always going to be in the back of your head. That's where I came from. Am I going, is there a part of me that is destined to go back to it? You know, I mean, I, I don't know. I can't speak for everyone here. But I, as I get older, now that I'm an adult, I think, um, I look at my father who up until I was 22 or whatever was just sort of somewhat of a super heroic figure to me, just a, a, a grown man who did all this stuff and he, was, he told me how to be and... You know, he was my dad. He was not like a real person, if that makes sense. And then once I got to know him as a person, I started seeing things in him that I was recognizing in my own development. And, and it f***ed with you a little bit because you go, oh, it, w did I ever have a choice with some of this stuff? Was this always going to be, are we really just the products or are we more? And so Shang-Chi is grappling with that just in a much more magnified way. Um and you're always playing with what's the right amount of this stuff to put in. And especially something like a Marvel movie where we were so interested in the story of identity. I'm not afraid of you.
Yes, you are. You've spent your entire life afraid. Always running. Always hiding. And so when Wu, I would say, is a is an invention of ours, you know, in the comic books, the, the ten... Fit, we always in the script we'd always have to like put a parenthetical like t we'd write the ten rings and be like the rings or the gang because there's a, the gang and then there's the physical rings in the comics they're physical rings they're actual literal rings that are worn on your fingers they each have different powers they're very very powerful um, but we were coming out of Endgame and and Marvel told us pretty bluntly, like, we don't want any more finger jewelry. Like, no, no more knuckle-based powers um, after the gauntlet, which is pretty specific and weird. But um, so we turned them into the iron hungar rings that you see in the movie. And so, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of invention that we got to do and had to do. Katie is exists solely for the sake of the movie. Obviously, um, Trevor Slattery comes back. That's a character that was from a previous film that we were lucky enough to be able to use, but we were inventing pretty much the entire way. I mean, I, I would have been happy to write that whole movie with no superpowers at all and nothing, no fights, nothing cool happens. But I have a lot to say about that stuff. But the truth is when you're operating inside of the MCU, there's a certain degree of spectacle that you have to deliver. It's part of the game. Um, I love that stuff. And so you don't have the time to just have characters drag you down with emotional, you know, sorry, excuse me, emotional baggage for two hours. So you're just trying to find like, what's most important? How do we most succinctly tell this story, this emotional story, and then make it make sense inside of the action? How do we make the action a part of the emotional journey rather than just like a thing that happens and then you get back to a conversation? Earlier you mentioned, actually, I think this is a bit of our uh, private conversation, the influences or ideas you wanted to have in Shang-Chi as far as having that San, San Francisco fight scene, having that fight scene among the bamboo sticks earlier between Wang Wu and his wife, um, specifically that one, that fight between the bamboo sticks, I couldn't help but think about Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Um I'm just curious what sort of influences for those moments and then those big uh, set pieces um, were for you. We knew that we were going to be aiming to do the best action sequences that Marvel had ever made. That was always part of the goal, just as a, as a sense of pride, uh, because, you know, we knew we were making a kung fu movie and we were making a kung fu movie or a Marvel movie more specifically where our hero is not wearing a mask. And so... Um, Every single sequence was designed to be physical, to be practical. That one was definitely designed to be a crouching tiger sequence. I mean, what we were trying to do is, how do we find all of these great moments from this insanely vast history of Asian cinema that a lot of people maybe haven't seen and that we're going to be bringing to Western eyes potentially for the first time? I wrote that scene and described it as, this is a dance. It is. It starts as a fight, and and it, it turns into a dance. And the, the, that word was always on the page, and um, I, I'm really happy with the way it turned out because I think that's really well reflected in the final sequence. Other sequences, like the bus fight, represent more of you know. There's a little bit of old boy in that bus fight. There's a there's a tracking like a side scroll tracking shot. We were just trying to pull from everywhere. The ending of Shang Chi. Um, again, spoilers, y'all are here, so I'm sure you've already seen it. Um, the moment where Shang-Chi falls into the lake and meets the dragon for the first time, it's so wonderful. The first meeting I took at Marvel after they hired me, they said, what do you want to see in this movie? And I said, a giant Chinese dragon. I just, I think it would be Awesome. You know, the initial reaction from Marvel was, okay, so he fights a dragon. I'm like, no, dragons are not evil in Eastern culture. Like, Chinese dragons are protector spirits. They're water spirits. And so then that's when it started this process of being like, oh, now we're learning. They're learning from me. We're learning together. We're doing research and trying to figure out how can we make that happen in a way that makes sense? Because once we realized that our dragon was going to be pretty traditional, was going to be a water spirit, was going to be a feminine entity, 
we knew that that was probably going to tie into some thematic around Shang-Chi's mother. So we worked backwards to figure out how it could happen. But we always knew that the first time you saw that dragon was in, going to be a quiet, emotional, that takes your breath away with the emotional power moment and not a thing breaks through a wall like the bad guy thing. Um, the de Dweller in Darkness. <laughs> So what was it like to create a film that was really important for um, this Asian American cinema and culture? And what are you hoping that it uh, sort of leads as a pathway to in the future? You know, my favorite movie once I did eventually start watching movies was Big Trouble in Little China. And I thought at the time that was because it was I mean, it's fucking rad. If you haven't seen Big Trouble in Little China, there's, you know, magic and there's all sorts of crazy shit going on and Kurt Russell's hair is amazing. <laughs> but what I realized as I got older is the reason I love that movie so much and that it spoke to me in a way I didn't understand as a kid is because the hero of that movie is an Asian guy. Because Dennis Dunn's character, Wang, is the, is the hero of that movie and Kurt Russell is playing his buffoon sidekick. And they've just flipped it and presented it in the way that they have because they have to. But Marvel, I think, from the position I'm in, seems to be the most successful franchise film making company of all time. And so to realize that they were asking me to put Asian people forward on the largest scale possible in a way that was going to reach so much further than any other American film had ever done. I got really emotional about it. I was just about to sign a contract to write a different movie that was also about um, an underrepresented group. And I was really excited about it. Um, and I think I told my wife on the car ride home, I just thought, I know I told them I would do it, but why would I tell someone else's story if someone's finally going to let me tell my own? How could I not? So it's been, it's been awesome. It, it's been everything I hoped it would be. Own Story is brought to you in part by the Alice Kleberg Reynolds Foundation, a Texas family providing innovative funding since 1979. And by the Bogle Family Vineyards, sixth-generation farmers, and third-generation winemakers, based in Clarksburg, California. Makers of sustainably grown wines that are a reflection of their family values since 1968. This project is supported in part by the Cultural Arts Division of the City of Austin Economic Development Department, the Texas Commission on the Arts, and the National Endowment for the Arts on the web at arts.gov. Our associate producers are Jamal Knox and Colin Heyer. Editing help from Travis Neely and Travis Kennedy Sound. Music by Brian Ramos. Production assistance comes from the Sound Lab Inc., Travis Kennedy Sound, and KUT 90.5 in Austin. Go to austinfilmfestival.com to find out more about the Austin Film Festival and Conference each October. Until next time, I'm Barbara Morgan, and this has been Austin Film Festival's On Story. <laughs>